As we go up these stairs, we also go back in time. From the late 1920s, we return to 1891, back when the main road in South Florida was Biscayne Bay. At the head of the stairs is a sitting room or foyer. This sitting room was originally part of the Commodore and Jesse's bedroom. The wall to the left was added during the 1926-28 renovations. One could sit here and read and write with plenty of available light. Jesse and Aunt Jody could watch the children play outside in the yard. The door that we are going through was not part of the original structure. There was a diamond shaped window in this wall. Here on the porch, or piazza, you can look out there and almost imagine this same view almost a hundred years ago. You can see yourself sitting in one of those chairs and enjoying the view. But now let's go back into the house. As we look around, we can see the octagonal shape and all the wood. Wood salvage from wrecks was used in the framing timbers. Finished wood was brought in by boat from Pensacola. The staircase was placed in the original dining room location. The built-in hutch or sideboard or Ralph's design remained where it was and was used for other storage. Behind the stairs was the original passage to the old kitchen. That kitchen was replaced in 1908 when the house was raised. In 1916, a lead water tank was installed there for the Commodore and Jesse's new bathroom. Looking straight up, you see the skylight, or clear story. The main window lets in plenty of light. The transoms below the main window open for air circulation. Another marine design incorporated into the house. As the children got older, it was their responsibility to open and close the Claristories transom windows. They also pumped up the water from the cistern to fill the water tank. As we move to the Commodore's bedroom, the wall paneling is made from tongue and groove cedar. Note that the paneling is laid out in a vertical pattern down to the chair rail. Below that, it is laid out diagonally. This was the original living room. The wall to the right, where the dresser stands, was added to help make the foyer, or sitting room. The wall behind the beds was bumped out to take in the piazza. These changes were part of the 1928 renovations. A bathroom was added to this room in 1916 and expanded in 1928. This door to the piazza was the original main entrance. The original front door was moved downstairs where it resumed its role as the main entrance. The beds are original. The bed on the left was the Commodore's. Jessie's bed on the right was larger to help accommodate her polio-induced infirmities. The crutches attest to the time she had trouble moving about. With her writing desk on the bed, one can assume she spent many days in her bed reading and writing letters. The furnishings in this bedroom are typical of the kind the Monroes would have used. Many of them are original. This chair was called by the family the shoe chair. The seat lifts up and reveals a storage space. The Commodore kept all his shoe shining paraphernalia in it. It is suspected that the original purpose was to store books or hymnals. You see a couple of doors in the wall on each side of the shoe chair. The one on the right opens to a closet. The other one to the left is the quote unquote stairs to the attic. The stairs to the attic are so steep they are more like a ladder. In fact, at one time they might have been a ladder. Ralph and Jesse lived here until their deaths. Ralph died in 1933, Jesse in 1940. After Jesse's death, Worth Monroe, his wife Mary, and their two sons, William and Charles, moved into the barnacle. We will leave the Commodore's bedroom, turn right, and go down the short corridor to the back of the second floor. This is the location of both the linen closet and Worth's bedroom. The linen closet was originally part of Worth's bedroom, which we will see next. The wall to the right and the window were added during the 1928 renovations. One might ask why a window in a closet? Easy. Having light and air circulation helped prevent mold and mildew. As you can see, this was very useful storage space. 
Now let's move on to worst bedroom. Originally, the room was probably used for storage and our guests visiting for the winter. Even after the house was raised, there were very few changes to it until 1928. At some time, it's not known when, the room was painted. It remains the only painted room on this floor. At one time, Aunt Dodie shared this room with the Monroe children. Then Patty moved into her bedroom. After the house was raised and the Commodore and Jesse moved to their new bedroom, Aunt Dodie moved into the bedroom the Monroes had occupied. Then Worth finally had the room all to himself. This has been left pretty much a boy's room. The closet and built-in drawers added in 1928 are typical of Ralph's marine influence design. No unused wasted space. You can see the typical items boys of Worth's era would be using. This would remain a boy's room even after Worth and his family moved into the barnacle. In fact, Ralph's grandsons would later share this room. The wooden rifle and the hammock were made by Ralph. As for the tricycle or velocipede, it is not original for an interesting reason. A young Patty and Worth went to the store and charged it to Jesse's household account. When Aunt Dodie found out, she returned the bike and meted out punishment. The velocipede is on loan from the Gamble Plantation State Park. Worth became an avid woodworker, marine surveyor, and later following in his father's footstep, a boat designer. Worth designed boats for the government as well as many popular commercial sailcraft. Like most of the house, this room underwent many changes in 1928. The bay window was added along with the window seat and a sink behind the screen. When the wall was constructed for the linen closet, the built-in dresser and closet were also added. Now we leave Worst's bedroom and go to the other side of the staircase to see Patty's bedroom. As we go to Patty's room, we see the butterfly net mounted on the wall. Worth and Patty were avid butterfly and moth collectors. We still have many of their collections in our collection. This was Ralph's bedroom when he first moved into the house and before it was raised. It remained his bedroom even after he married Jesse. Jesse took the adjoining bedroom at the back of the house. After Patty was born, Jesse's sister Josephine Worth moved in to help with the caring and raising of Patty and then Worth. In 1903 to 1904, the back bedroom was enlarged by building it out and encompassing the space originally used by the piazza. At this time, Ralph and Jesse moved into the adjoining back bedroom and this became Patty's room. Patty was actually born Martha Worth Monroe, but the family called her Patty after her great-grandmother Monroe. The name stuck and everyone knew her as Patty. Patty was able to have her way with many things. It was Patty's wish that she have a four-poster bed. The Monroes indulged her. Dolls were another of Patty's passions. That little four-poster bed on the floor was made for Patty by the Commodore because, as Patty put it, I have a four-poster bed, so should my dolls. There was no doubt about who was the apple of Daddy's eye. Mom's, too. Jesse made the bed clothes for the doll bed. The baby carriage standing prominently in the middle of the room was originally bought for Patty around 1900. Though it is over 100 years old, it still works. Once she grew out of it, guess who then made it the stroller for her dolls? In 1928, this room was also bumped out. As with the Commodore's bedroom, a bathroom was added to this room. The bathroom was shared by Aunt Dodie. The other doors here are for the built-in closet. Patty married William Catlow Jr. in 1932. She and her husband moved to New Jersey. They moved back to Coconut Grove in 1962. Patty was active in what is now History Miami, the Coconut Grove Library Association, and many other South Florida organizations until she died in 1991. We'll now leave Patty's bedroom, turn left, go past the old hutch, and on down to the sewing room in Aunt Dodie's room. In the 1926-28 renovations, the Commodores had the octagonal areas of the rooms adjacent to the old dining room now landing squared off. 
This allowed him to create the foyer, the linen closet, the sewing room, without affecting the overall architecture of the original design. He was also able to expand the living space in all the other rooms. The sewing room was made by adding a wall to Aunt Dodie's bedroom. By placing the door to her bedroom in this wall, the Commodore was able to put in some additional shelves for storage. We have used this area to display old medicine and patent medicine containers. At the same time, her room was built out to the piazza space and bay windows and window boxes were also added. The sewing machine was manufactured in 1873. It was part of many of the family furnishings that found their way from up north. As you can see, it is a pedaled, powered machine. A lot of clothes were made on it. This includes a pair of pants Jessie made for herself and actually wore in public. Not exactly the norm for that period. It's also rumored that the Commodore used the sewing machine to make sails. We will now step into Aunt Dodie's bedroom. Jessie Worthman Rhodes, sister Sarah Josephine, came down to South Florida to help with Patty. Once Worth was born, she basically took over a lot of the child rearing. She was known as Aunt Dodie by the children and everyone else. Due to the frailty of Jessie's health, Aunt Dodie basically ran the house. The children did a lot of the chores, but Dodie was major domo. She also assisted in the children's education. It was she who got Patty and Worth interested in collecting butterflies. As a young girl, Patty tended to be sickly. One night in 1902, Patty became very ill. Aunt Dodie hopped on a bicycle to fetch the doctor from Miami. There was a road, but it was just hard-packed marl. It went through five miles of the hammock. Dodie took a light to see the road and a rifle. The rifle was not for any two-legged creatures, but just in case she encountered a panther or a bear on the way. Aunt Dodie stayed on permanently at the barnacle after the children had grown. She eventually became librarian at the Coconut Cove Library. She lived in the house until her death in 1959 at age 92. Before we go back downstairs, a note about the attic. When the state took possession of the barnacle, an extensive inventory was done. During the inventory, a trunk stored in the attic was opened. Inside was discovered an historical treasure. A large number of photographic glass plate negatives were found. Ralph's treasury of historic images taken from the 1870s helped document the life and history of early South Florida. In fact, only a small portion of those images have been used in this video. Stored and surviving in this attic for at least 75 years, those images give us all a glimpse of another era long gone and never to be seen again.